All right. Welcome to episode 73 of the Jake Blanchard podcast. First, a quick shout out to Fellowship Brand, premium men's grooming products. JBP, as always, at checkout gets you 10% off your order. They got beard oils, balms. If you got tattoos, they got tattoo oil too. Go check them out, fellowshipbrand.com. Also, Stream to See, they're the top mineral-based sunscreen in existence. They're all natural. They have no estrogen mimickers, not harmful to your body or the environment. They also make personal care products. Go check them out, stream2c.com. JBP at checkout, 10% off. My guest today is a man named Kane. Uh, but, you know, he's been on quite an interesting journey uh, in his life, uh, including uh, the progression from uh, being a doorman at some of Hollywood's uh, biggest A-list clubs to running security and private protection for celebrities uh, and events across the country. Uh, he's with me today, and I'm so excited to just kind of unpack the journey of his life, talk about some of the perspectives that he's gained along the way. Uh, so thankful uh, for uh, for Kane to join me today. So, uh, Kane, welcome to the podcast, brother. Thank you for having me. Dude, you know, I uh, as I was getting prepared for this po podcast, I could not help but think about how important security is uh, in the times that we're living in, my man. I mean, there is so many people of influence. There are so many people with strong opinions. Um, I bet you're in pretty high demand these days. Yeah, there's a lot of work. You know, I'm very selective on who I work with and, and who I work for. Though. So how do you describe um, the industry that you work in? Do you call it security? Do you call it private protection? Is there kind of like a better term or umbrella uh, for the industry? Private protection, I think, is, is it, you know, I mean, uh, safety advising, you know, depending on what it is that the person or business or company needs. Okay. And then so... Like, what is like a day in, take me through like a quick day in life. And I, I want to get into how you got into this industry, but I'd, I'd love to just kind of understand, like, what are you thinking about day to day or like, what is the, the relationship with the individuals that, that you work with like? I mean, the relationship that I create and that they create with me, you know, I, you know, you're so in close contact with people, you know, and, and you get the ideas is when you're when you're in private protection and you're a safety advisor for one individual, the goal is to know that human so well that you can anticipate different signs from them, from other, other people around. And, you know, it's, it's really about you studying and knowing your client and how well you know the client will then enable you to do a better job. Okay. Very good. So then is this like a, like, it's not like a nine to five thing. I mean, is this like 24 seven? Like how, how might this, these relationships work? It, that all varies as well too. You know, I mean, a lot of times you're on call 24 seven, you know, so, uh, you know, you're, you could be on your way to the beach with your family and then all of a sudden get a call and it's go time. And then all of a sudden you're, you're getting ready to go. Or you could be, you know, asleep, you know, uh, in the middle of the night and then get a call that it's time to go and then be strapped up and ready to go in minutes. You know, I'd always keep, I always keep my, my gear bag ready to go at all times. Oh, so you, I mean, you, you travel around with it. Like you're ready to rock and roll like at a moment's notice. Yeah. Wow. So then let's, uh, let, let's go back to kind of the origin story here. Like, is this something that you'd always been interested in doing since you were like a kid? Like, um, was it like, I, and what I mean is like, there's a lot of kids that gravitate toward like police or military or those types of things, or is this something that you kind of found your way into later in like, through? I think a little, a little bit of, a little bit of it all, you know what I mean? Like I, I always gravitated towards protecting people, you know, ever since I was a kid, you know, so that was always a natural, a natural thing that I, I felt I needed to do. You know, I always looked after anybody else and everybody else and, was willing to get knocked out or lose teeth for it. You know what I mean? And, and you know, that just evolved to me be, being, a, you know, on a level of, of, I mean, I watched The Bodyguard when I was a kid with Kevin Costner. Yeah. And I absolutely loved it. I thought, how cool is this guy, you know, that he would just put his life on the line for other people. And I just, I felt so pulled to that. And then like, and the other the other opposition of it was Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. So oh, it was like yeah. those two those two worlds combined is what my world was. You know what I mean? In a lot of ways. So I mean, you know, I always felt the need to do this, 
And I'm so thankful that I've been placed in a position to where I can do what I feel like I'm good at and, and aid in other people's safety. Okay. And then, so from a, from a childhood standpoint, like what, what was that like? Did, were you, did you come from a, a home where it was like traditional, like, Hey, let's go to college and go study the, those types of things. Did you find yourself out on the street at kind of a younger age? Like how, how, do, how might that work? You know, I, you know, I came from broken families, you know, my, my natural father, you know, got locked up when I was three, you know, didn't come back into my life till I was 18. Uh, my mom remarried a few times, you know, she, she did her best, you know, there's no handbook for being a parent as we know, you know, and, and um, she married two good men that did their best as well. But I was, I was, you know, grew up around a lot of gang activity. You know, I grew up around a lot of people that didn't have things, you know, and, and, you know, I think that that was a strong motivator for me. I, I, I went to a continuation school in Venice. Somebody tried to stab me with a screwdriver, a long skinny screwdriver. I was in the corner. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't run, you know, so I had to defend myself. There's no choice, you know, and then I got kicked out of school for that. So then I just decided just to start working, you know, and, and uh, so I started working and then took my brother in at 14. When he was 14, I was 17, you know, and, and we just started working our, our butts off, you know, so to say. So, so then uh, what kind of jobs were you able to get at 17 years old in, in uh, well, West I, LA? I, yeah. So, I mean, my mom had just moved up to West Hollywood. And so I had uh, followed her and then I was walking through the parking lots behind the sunset strip to tower video, which, you know, we all know is gone now, but like, yeah. which was right next to the Viper room. And, you know, I didn't know what the Viper room was or anything. And, and, and I just asked the guy in the parking lot, Hey, are you, are you hiring? You know, I'd like to work, you know, and, and he said, come back tonight at nine o'clock. So then I just started working for him, you know, seven days a week. And then I got another job at a store called Oz on the corner of Sunset and uh, San Vicente, right above the parking lots, you know, and so I would work 10 to six in the store and then put on my parking jacket and work from six to two, you know, and I, I did the store six days a week. And then I did the, uh, the parking lot seven nights a week. You know? Wow. Well, in the Viper room, obviously a historical uh, place on the sunset strip. I mean, when people think of um, kind of West Hollywood in that way, I mean, the comedy store comes to mind. Um, the Viper room comes to mind too. You mentioned tower video uh, as well. I mean, I recently watched a documentary uh advice called dark side of the nineties. And it, it talks specifically about, uh, the Viper room and actually calls it Hollywood's sanctuary. And for a lot of people who don't know, a lot of A-list celebrities, uh, showing up at, at the Viper room, it kind of became this like very tight niche, interesting club, at least as an outsider looking in, um, how, like, can you reflect on that time period a little bit on uh, what it must've been like to, to be uh, kind of the controller of the velvet rope at, at a, at a iconic I place like that. I didn't, I didn't, let's be, let's just be clear. I didn't start off as, you know, running, <laughs> you know what I mean, I, I remember as a kid, I was parking cars, you know, I met Timothy Leary. I met Hunter S Thompson, Johnny Cash. I mean, like I had no idea um, the level of life of these people that had lived that I was meeting. I mean, I was just a young, you know, guy coming out of gang activity and like just, trying to get my bearings straight in life and like parking cars. I was parked. It was when Lambos and Porsches and Ferraris are all still stick shifts. You know, I remember the first time ballet in those cars and like stalling out in front of everybody and, and having that humility, like, oh man, you know, but like, you know, I remember talking to the head of security back in the days as a kid, like, Hey, I want to, I want to work the door. I was only 17, you know, and he's like, oh, no, it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like, you know, and, and back in those days, the Sunset Strip was crazy. You know, there was a lot going on all the time. So there was fights everywhere. You know, the whiskeys would have riots roll down the hill into the parking lot. Guys, parking lot was rough back then. So I got I, I, I got into a, uh, I defended myself quite often, you know, and, and then so I developed a reputation about, you know, um, dealing with situations and altercations and and if it wasn't for uh, Big Ed Shaw, who was Johnny Depp's uh, head of security, he was the one that really, as a youngster, was like, yo, hey, you know, like, I'm going to teach you the game. You know, you, you, I know you can sling those things, but we're going we're gonna to teach you how to use your head. 
you know, and, and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. You know, he really mentored me through and still mentors me to this day about a lot of things, you know, but being part of the Viper Room, they became my family, you know, coming from broken homes. You know, I always seeked and not having like a full time father figure. I always seek like out like the people to be my family, you know, and, and then to be part of uh, to look up to or, or feel part of. And, you know, the, the Viper Room really embraced me as a family, you know, and, and I did every job. You know, I mean, there was no job I didn't do if, if they were like, hey, we need someone to come clean. I was ready to clean, you know, it's uh, wash dishes, uh, pour drinks, uh, do the sound, run wire, help with, the, you know, construct whatever it was. I never said no, you know, and, and, and because of that, you know, I was invited into the tight niche A-list circle of Hollywood in the in the 90s as a youngster. You know, I was, you know, I remember getting invited into clubs under an alias, no ID required, you know, and, and then going in. But then I, I had an epiphany. I'm like, why am I here? I'm not cool. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, I don't have money and I'm not famous. And I realized it was because I worked so hard and earned the respect of the A-list of Hollywood and those of the 90s to where I was part of it. But then I, after that, I realized I'm not going out anymore. I'm going to get paid to go out. You know what I mean? And, and I just started working harder and grinding more and starting on so many levels. But to be part of the bike room in those days, it was a club. You know what I mean? Like, and, and there was celebrities and all sorts of people that couldn't get into the club. And here I was just randomly accepted into this club, but it wasn't because I was cool. I knew, I knew why I yeah. was there, you know, but I was family. You know, I mean, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for, you know, Johnny Depp and, and a lot of others there, like I said, Big Ed Shaw, but, but a lot, a lot had to do with mentoring me, you know, on, on so many levels, you know, that was such a huge part of my life, you know, so it happened so quick. <laughs> no, I bet. Just a, a flash for sure, man. Um, you know, there's a, a that that whole area uh, in, in the West Hollywood area, Sunset Strip, I mean, really famous for lots of uh, drug use and excess and things like that. How do you, uh, is, is that something that you found yourself getting kind of it's interesting, I guess, with the dichotomy of like security, because you have to be the clear headed individual who's like looking around and looking after people and those types of things. Like, how did that shape your perspective in security being around so much drinking, so many, you know, potential substances and, and things like that floating around there? Do you stay pretty clean in that? Or did you have your did you have your battles? No, I, I didn't need I had, you know, I, I got lucky, too. Like I said, I grew up around a lot of gang activity and I had a lot of OGs always guiding me. You know, going, hey, you know, you see those people over there, they're on this. You don't mess with that. You see those people over there, they're on this. And I got educated, you know, and got to see how people lived that were doing these types of things, you know. And, and then as far as Hollywood goes, I already had like a, I always had like a good sense of understanding of who I was. So I didn't need to do drugs and I didn't need to excess drink. You know, I mean, as a kid, I, I drank alcohol, but I, I never liked being drunk I never liked you know losing my wits I always liked having my wits about me you know and, and I don't drink I don't smoke I don't I don't self-medicate you know and then I, I came into a stage in my life where I was like you know I'm not going to self-medicate I'm going to self-heal I'm going to I'm going to deal with all these things that you know people drink and smoke and do these things to to damper down I, I, I want to open it up and let it out and, and heal myself so that's what I did you know Oh, I love it, man. So then uh, Viper Room for a number of years, and then you found yourself, uh, what, at, at various clubs on Sunset? Or, or kind yeah, of what? After, take me through that after, progression. After the Viper Room, I mean, like, you know, I, uh, you know I'll, ne I'll never forget when I was invited to work the door at the Viper Room, you know, and it, we just worked an event down at the Aerospace Museum, you know, with Brent Bolthouse, another OG of the days. And I, they wanted me to work the door there. So that was the first door that I worked as a youngster. And then, then I remember... Get on my way back up to Hollywood from San Diego, getting a call from one of the managers at the bike room saying, Hey, you know, we want you to come, you know, work the door tonight. Can you make it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. I, mean? so I just drove straight up and put on my 
suit that somebody gave me, you know, oversized, not fitted suit, <laughs> just with my Chuck Taylors and like, you know, it was an interesting dynamic, you know, being five foot eight, 167 pounds, you know, trying to be a bouncer in those days, you know, all these guys are all giant men, you know, and, and you know, I remember after I'd left the Viper room after JD had lost it or gave it up, whatever, you know, I, I was trying to get a job as a bouncer you know, all these different clubs and guys were laughing at me. Oh, what do you think you're going to, you know, look how little you are. You can't do what we do. And like, you know, I got, it was very, very humbling, you know, cause I didn't realize that how much love that I got from my brother, Ed and all these other guys. And then accepted me for me, you know, regardless of how small I was or whatever, you know, so I got laughed at a lot, ridiculed a lot. And then finally another guy, another big OG in, in the game that was running the key club back in the days took me in. You know, and that ended up being like a crazy experience for me too, you know, to be part of the Key Club. Key Club was doing so many different shows back in the days on the Sunset Strip that every night you had a different genre of, per of people, you know? So you may have, you know, crazy gangsters one night and then you may have country the next night and you may have death metal the next night and, you know, punk rock the next night is constantly changing. Uh, that where I had to develop skills to adapt and acclimate. And I'll never forget the time when, you know, he's like, all right, Kane, you're going to go work the pit. And it's like some crazy death metal, Hispanic death metal band called Bruharia, which was like full of nothing but gangbangers, like just moshing the crazy. I've never even been in a mosh pit in my life. And then here I am in the mosh pit. I'm like, all right, what do I do? You know, they already stripped me of my radio, so I'm ghost. I can't even get in contact with anybody if I need it. And then, like, I remember seeing someone just go down so hard in front of me. And there's, like, maybe three, 400 people in the pit area. And I just, my instincts went in. Boom. I just dove right in, picked them up. And I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to help people, you know? What I yeah, mean? So just, I just pull them, pick them up in the like, pit. <laughs> I just had to dodge elbows, and fist, and the flying arms and all that stuff. And, and then I ended up falling in love with that, too, you know? And then, you know, but I worked, I learned so much there. And it taught me it enhanced my ability to adapt. And then also, you know, you, we get good at what we do every day. So whatever you're doing every day, you're gonna get good at, you know? And, and at that time in my life, you know, I was, I earned the name Kane because I was able to diffuse and deescalate. And, you know, I mean, I've deescalated and diffused, I don't even know, thousands of fights in my life. You know, we would, we would go through 50, 60,000 people, 100,000 people a month. And you just, you keep going, you keep going and, and you learn that, you know, you, the idea is when somebody's at the point where they can lose everything and go crazy and hurt themselves or someone else, it's not about the person that's going to push them over to the side. It's about the person that can reel them back down. And I got really good at that, you know, and, and then at the, there's times when, you know, somebody, you know, would be on drugs or alcohol that, you know, maybe they're girl left them or cheated on them or they lost their place. I mean, you start having empathy for people. So you try to connect and, and, and realize it's not personal towards you. You know, they could be yelling and screaming a lot. They all do. Everyone thinks they're a tough guy. You know what I mean? And, you know, and as, as a youngster, I, I was coming up in this and I got good at it, you know, and, and then I would, and if it didn't go that way, well, I got good at that too. You know what I mean? Put a lot of people to sleep in my life. You know what I mean? And, and would, also wake them back up with, with compassion and have a bottle of water for them. And then, you know, that even worked into my mojo. Of like, I would explain to people like, yo, hey, you know, they just beat up this person and bouncers took them out. They're going crazy. And they call Kane, call Kane. I'd come running up and I'd be like, hey. And I'd go right to their ear. A lot of guys, they talk so loud so everyone could hear them. i just talk right to them. You know, I didn't need everyone else's interject. Just have my own and be like, yo, hey, check it out. You're a tough guy in your life. I know it. All right, right, right. I'm like, yeah. So you could tell me how many people you knocked out or put to sleep. Oh, yeah, da, da, da. dog, I don't have a number for that. And I'm not even a tough guy, but I've trained my whole life for this moment right here. I'm going to tell you, you're going to go to sleep. And I, and, and I don't have a number for how many people that I put to sleep, but I have a number for how many people that I put to sleep too long and had to revive. And that's really scary. And I've always been scared of every fight I've ever been into. And you're a tough guy. You're stronger than me. I'm really scared. So I might go too hard on you. You know what I yeah. mean? Then I'm going to get scared that you're going to die. I don't want to go through that. So here, I'll buy you a drink. The next time you come back, just walk away with your, your pride intact. And nine out of 10 times, that'll work. You know, I mean, you, you learn it's really not taking things personal in your life. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've 
I've heard kind of a, a, a similar perspective, especially like being in traffic. Like, you know, you never know when somebody's like at an eight or a nine, like they're just, you know, some people are having road rage, but they're not really mad about what's happening on the road. They're mad about all these other things. And it's just manifesting because driving is the thing that they're doing. So maybe similarly, like people go to clubs and they've got this, you know, they, they kind of, that, that social lubricant, having some alcohol, having some whatever, and then those walls come down and then it just, it just comes out, manifests in some really weird, strange ways. I'm sure you've seen. A lot, a lot, you know, and, and but ultimately, I think with empathy, we understand that, you know, and, and, and I was able to develop that skill set in those times. And then from there, I, you know, then I started getting invited to run clubs, you know, or run security at clubs and build teams. And, you know, that was a whole nother art in itself. I get hired like as a, you know, just a basic security guy, knowing that I was going to take over the whole team and just watch how they did their things, who was doing this and that and the other. And then, that developed into a, where I would even roll in later in the game, hat on, super low, pretending like I was drunk, seeing bribing people, seeing what I could get away with, watching who was selling what and doing this, that, and the other, and then get introduced the next day or two as the director of security and just be like, all right, you're done, you're done. I can work with you, I can work with you, and just then build up from there. So you got some straight up like real Patrick Swayze, like fix it roadhouse kind of <laughs> shit going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. You know, I mean, you know, I've had bottles bashed over my head. My teeth have been knocked out a gang of times. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, I've been in the middle of riots and melees with a lot of good people, so shoulder to shoulder, back to back. You know what I mean? It's, it's definitely, you know, that that's a lot of learning too. You know what I mean? Like you, you definitely, when you got a whole parking lot full of people getting down or like we would get fights breaking out into the sunset strip where it shut down traffic on both sides, people getting knocked out into cars, all sorts of stuff, you know, and like that's a different flow to, to go into, you know, you, you learn, you know, with, with all the doors I worked, all the different positions of security that I worked coming up in the game, that's what made me who I am today, but I've learned to be the rock in the rapids, you know what I mean? I make the rapids. You know, and you, you have to be so firmly planted with whatever you're doing and whatever you're about that no matter what's coming at you, you stay consistently the same, you know. And, and so how, how many years were you specifically in the clubs? And then when, when did this, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty logical bridge to cross to go into private security, but like when, when did that transition take place? I was in, I mean, I was in the clubs for a long time. I don't even, you know, I mean, since I was a kid, you know, so, I mean, like I said, I, I was, I was a bus boy, bar back, cleaner, you know, a bartender, a doorman, a bouncer, you know, head of security, direct till I evolved to level out being a director of security, I was a general manager, I was a director of operations, you know, a bar manager, I mean, like a, a sound guy, shit, I did the sound at the opium den when, when system of a down was there every Thursday. You know what wow. I mean? Like that was that was a, a special time too. I mean, I'm like, a huge System of a Down fan, by oh, the way. Same. I would do. It was a whole nother level. You know what I mean? Never, never seen part. them live. It's on, it's on my bucket list of like bands oh, that oh. I need to see live. I see a lot of live rock shows, and they're like one of the four, including Tool, that like I've just never gotten to see live yet. Yeah, they're they're good people too. You know, so that's awesome. I mean, it it it, it was more so. You know, I was running one club you know, for, for someone and he had celebrity investors. And so, you know, there, there just came a time and, and it was uh, Diana Ross's, uh, her sons that had invested into this club. And, you know, they, they had reached out to me, actually the owner of the club reached out to me, Michael Sutton said, Hey, I think that uh, this would be a good fit for you. And it was just by accident that, that it, that it happened like that. And then, Next thing I knew, I was in Detroit for five weeks. You know what I mean? And and from there, it just, you know, ended up being that family, the Ross family, blessed myself and my family with so much. You know what I mean? They, they're still very close to me to this day, you know? So it just happened by accident, really. I mean, or I, I don't even know accident. That's not the right way. It just happened with without me planning, you know? And it was definitely beyond my control of, of what was about, what I was about to embrace how I was going to graduate to this next level uh, of personal safety, you know, and, and then all of a sudden I found myself in other States. Like, like I said, we're in, you know, Detroit and then we're going to clubs 
And I was like, okay. So I had to take everything that I learned from all these different clubs. And then I had to adapt on the fly. You know, like when you, when you roll to a new venue or a new club or, or anything like that, there's a lot of things going on. You may have never even, like a lot of times when you're doing personal safety, your idea is to go to a place ahead of time and get a map, meet the, the head of security, understand, you know, where, where things are, exits, and, you know, just have alternate strategies to get out, and, uh, safe zones, and, you know, and, and a lot of times you don't have that ability because you just, you're on the fly. You, you're at a spot and they're like, okay, we're out of here. Boom, going to the next spot. Like, oh, okay, all right, you know, and you just, you, you just have to adapt. And like, so I'd roll into these places and I'm making every team my team. You know, and I have minutes to have all these dudes, these, these other OGs of their own life, fall in love with who I am and then be an extension of myself. So we're all connected in minutes, you know, and I got the more I did this, the better I got at it, you know. And, and so, you know, I will walk into a place to this day. You know, I mean, there's so many things that I learned that just now I don't even have to think about. But I would go in there and I would and I would I would just picture what happens if the lights go out. And that would be the first question I would have. Okay, if the lights go out, what do we do? You know, and then from there I create my plan, you know, and, and you know, but there's a lot of little variables that go with that too, you know, because things change. All of a sudden, you know, there was no people, over, there wasn't hardly anybody over here and all of them were over here and now it's filled up and then you got to do reset. Okay, now what do we do? Mm. That was my safe spot. Now that safe spot is not there. Now my safe spot is, okay, now I know what I'm going to do here. And sometimes it's like, okay, if something were to go down, how are we going to deal with that? You know, I mean, so you got the primary exit and you're, you're taking notes in your head, of, like as you're going into a spot, you know, okay, mental note here, there, 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 you know, and, and what happens if, you know, there's an earthquake or a fire and it's not a fire, this, that, and that exit or that entrance gets blocked off by something. What's an alternative? You have to think about these things constantly. How, you know, are the, do, and, you know, if you have a driver, if you're lucky enough to have a driver, you're in contact with the driver constantly updating, hey, where are you at? Which, you know, I need you to be over here now. And when I was running A-list clubs, you know, we would have celebrities that wouldn't want to be seen. So we'd have like, you know, it was like cat and mouse with these paparazzi dudes, you know, we'd have to set up decoys going out this way, that way, and then actually get them out this way without them being seen, you know. And the same thing would be for us, you know, no matter, you know, who it was that we were with, you know, sometimes we'd want to be seen, sometimes we wouldn't, you know. Wow. And so, um, you know, from that private security standpoint, I mean, being with a family for five weeks at a time or, or more, like you were with, um, based on some of the things that uh, I learned about you, uh, Diana Ross, Dan Bolzerian, uh, Stan Lee, um, obviously working a ton with, with Dan Fleischman, who's, you know, obviously one of the, the top entrepreneurs in the country <laughs> and businessmen. Also, also Dan Fleischman is one of the best humans I've ever Absolutely. met in my life. You know, I'll just be right there with you. It's, it's, there's not a lot of people like him on this planet. I'll tell you that. Yeah. I got to spend uh, a two to three minutes around him, uh, recently, obviously where, where I met you as well, Operation Black Site. And, um, he just has an energy about him, man. Very calm very collective and, and no matter what so he's he is like you you look at him he is the rock that makes the rapids you know what i mean because like it doesn't matter what's coming at him in every facet every direction his heart stays the same you know it's, and that's i'm always learning from that you know i love it man so you're so you've been doing this for years i mean i'd, I'd love to hear i mean obviously i want to hear a little bit about stan lee so close to him, uh, especially toward, toward the end of his life. I also want to hear a little bit about Dan, uh, Polzerian, who at a time had a pretty wild, uh, existence. I know he's not a, as much uh, in the public eye today, but uh, there's a time there was a, a lot of excess, a lot of stuff going on. I mean, how frequently were, were you with him and is there anything you could share about that experience? I mean, the, the things that I can share is like, I started off, I got a call, um, from an old playmate model. Uh, and she had said, Hey, there's this guy, he's doing all these parties in the Hills. He needs a good doormat. And so I was like, Oh, cool. I mean, I've done thousands of events in, in yeah. my life, Hills all over the place, you know? So, you know, and, and, um, I was like, cool, I'll do it. This is my rate, you know? And they said, no problem. And then they wanted me to have a couple other guys. Okay. That's the rate here. And then no problem. And then it, it, he, he only wanted the hottest chicks to come in 
And, and that, that was hard for me because I'm so empathetic towards people. I'm, I don't want to hurt this girl's feelings. So I had to come up and navigate ways to like, yo, hey, you're not on the list. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was so hard for me, but I did it. I did a great job, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, I, he wanted, you know, there would be very strict list on what guys were allowed to come in. And no matter how much money I was offered, I, I, I never took, that's one thing about me. Is I never took a bribe in home. There's not no, hold, one hold on a second. for real. Like, and I'm not challenging your, your, your uh, ethics, but that, that's a hard thing to believe as a doorman for as long as you uh, uh, worked in the space. That's, that's an incredible fact. Uh, I never took a bribe, you know, I got tipped, you know, but the tips come on the way out, you know, after you provide a good level of service, but I never took a bribe wow. and I turned and when I was with, uh, before I was with him, but when I started doing his events, I was offered thousands of dollars, you know, for those small parties, you know, and I just shut up, I, I, no, uh, you know, and then I remember the big one that he did, it was all playmates, all the, the lingerie party, all these hot chicks, you know, and, and I think we had 300 and maybe close to 350, 330 something of, of, of people in there. And there was only like a dozen guys in this whole party, you know, so I was getting offered crazy money. I mean, like I turned down so much money and I, you know, it's so funny. You just, you just doing these things because it's, it's, it's my brand. It's who I am. You know what I mean? It's my integrity. I, I still have my integrity. Not a lot of people can say at 45 coming up the way I came up, that they have their integrity. To me, it's very important. I'm going to die with my integrity. But like, I'll never forget getting called up the next day after that, 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 that party, which was crazy, crazy, by the way. And, and you know, and then Dan's like, Hey, I, I heard you turned down a little bit of money last night. I was like, yeah, I turned down a little bit, you know, and I turned probably, you know, over 10 K down easy. I mean, probably closer to 20, you know, but, but, and I, and he's like, well, I got a little, and he gave me a stack. And I was like, wow. I was like, whoa, I didn't expect that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, and he's like, and by the way, you know, I want you to come on board. I want you to be my head of security and I want you to build me a team of, of, of coppers, you know? And so I, I was like, great, I'll, I'll do it. You know, and he paid me a lot of money, you know, and he was, you know, he was really good to me, you know, I mean, awesome. his brother, his, his brother was great to me, you know, they're, they're, they treated me like family too, you know, and, and it was, it was, it was fun. I, you know, and, and when he would fly around, he would, uh, him and his brother would, would invite my family as well, you know, my, my daughters, you know, on their, on to be, you know, go to here, there, whatever they, they really made my family be part of their family. And, and that was beautiful too. You know. That's outstanding. And and speaking of that, um, you know, Stan Lee, um, and, and and I think hopefully everybody who's listening to this podcast understands who Stan Lee is. Um, but you serve Stan. Uh, his ashes. Yeah, you've got you said you have his ashes around your neck. Yeah. Um, Stan Lee is uh, obviously the the creator of of Marvel. Um, so many characters that he's developed. So many things that uh, we all know and see today especially in the movies as, as uh, and shows and, and those types of things um outstanding man doing a lot of uh he did quite a bit of press and comic cons and things like that toward um his latter years what what was that like spending time with stan you know it was sacred you know i mean it was powerful it was i think to be around anybody that's in their mid 90s like that is just a huge blessing on your own life to be around someone that has that much knowledge and wisdom and experience of life in general. And then you throw somebody in the mix that is that age with the mind of, of Mr. Lee. I mean, that's, that's incredible. I mean, like the, the conversations, you know, when he would, op when he finally opened up to me and talked to me about how he created certain characters and, you know, like it was, you know, he, he was very inspirational to be around and, and, and he was such a kind, loving soul. You know, like I remember I would make organic, I lived with them two weeks out of every month and, and I would, you know, I would make these organic juices, the worst tasting juices you could imagine, ginger, turmeric, <laughs> carrots, uh, celery. I mean, just like beets. I mean, like just you pound it, you know what I mean? Like, and the doctor was like, yo, you can give them four ounces every month, you know? So you know, I'd give him four ounces. And there was one morning the nurse gave it to him and he, he takes a drink off it and I'm in the other room. And he's like, oh my God, that is the worst tasting medicine I've ever had in my life. What medicine is this? And then the nurse was like, 
oh, Mr. Lee, that's, that's the juice that Kane made for you. And he's like, wait a second, let me try that again. Wow, this is the best juice I've ever had in my life. You know, like, <laughs> like he never wanted anybody to feel bad around him, ever. And if he thought he, your, your feelings could be hurt by him or in some way or another, he would, he would do his best to navigate to where he did. You know, and, and you know, he was such a, such a, a kind person you know, and just cared so much, so deeply, you know, and, and I'll forever be thankful for the time that, that, that I shared with him in his life, you know, and, and, you know, the conversations that we would have, you know, like, you know, I remember one time he said, Kane, uh, Kane, I was like, come run it over. Hey, Mr. Lee, what's up? He's like, sit down, you know? So I sat down next to him and, and, uh, he goes, you know, when I was a kid, I used to love sketching cowboys and Indians. And I was like, oh, that's great, Mr. Lee. That's cool, you know? And he's like, I was thinking I would sketch you something. And I was like, nah, <laughs> I'm good, Mr. Lee. I'm not up here to have you do that, you know? And, and he's like, no, I, I, I wanna sketch you something. It, it could be worth a lot of money. And I was like, no, nah, Mr. Lee, I'm not here to have you sketch things for me. But if you wanna sit and have a conversation, look out at your pool, I'm down for that. And, and we would have long conversations about all sorts of things, you know? He loved his wife so much, you know? He spoke about his wife so much, you know? And, and he would just ask a lot of questions about what, he, what I thought about life after death with him, and, you know, you know? But I'll forever honor the time that I, that I spent with Mr. Lee. I am definitely a better person because of that. Wow. What, what a, uh, I appreciate that window. That's a, some powerful reflection there, my man. And thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, one, one of the things that perplexed me as I was preparing for this, um, thinking, putting myself in the position of somebody who's doing private security um, is like how weird people in our society can be about people who have celebrity or have some kind of perspective or influence on the world. So like the, the, the idea that because you've written comic books, for instance, that somebody would want to, or the, the idea that, you know, that, that you're a famous singer uh, or a famous business entrepreneur and investor, that somebody would want to like kidnap you or perform violence against you, or they're obsessed with you or your family in some way or unwanted media, like that's a strange world. And like, I'd love your perspective and in getting into the minds of those individuals. And how frequently do you interact with people who have some kind of, I don't know, hang up or malice uh, toward, toward the individuals that you're providing support for? You know, uh, some, I mean, when you're looking at, you know, there's so many things to look for, you know, I mean, when you're, you're focusing on a, a group of people, if you're at a concert, you know, or something and you're, 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 you're watching everybody, you know, you're, you're looking for, for certain things, but if you're, you know, sometimes you don't, it's, uh, you can't understand people if you can't relate to them, you know, and, you know, but, but I think that if you learn to expect the unexpected, you know, if you learn to anticipate that, you know, you're going to be dealing with people that aren't doing well in their life and, and, you know, aren't happy in their life. And, and a lot of people want to blame other people. They project on the other people, you know what I mean? So I can't, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't say, you know, what is or what, what, what is going through other people's minds, but I'm gonna stop it, you know? And, and my intuition is sharp. My antennas are always up. So, I mean, there, there, there's so many different things that, that you, that go into what I do, you know? And, and, you know, I, I do my best to stay as transparent as possible with no strings attached to anything to where I can be in the ready position at all times and be ready to pivot at any time, you know, and, and, you know, you, you, you need to, unex you need to expect the unexpected with humans period, you know, yeah. and, and, but I tend to, you know, I tend to keep people very safe that I'm around and it's beyond, beyond me sometimes, I think, you know what I mean? It just, I just feel like I'm always putting out the best energy possible to I don't attract any negativity. I don't attract any, any, uh, a lot of the stuff that I think a lot of people are looking for, you know? Mm -hmm. So 
I'm my 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 waves of energy are de-escalating and diffusing and creating the best outcome. You know, uh, is what I've evolved to be at this point in my life. You know, but it, it's fascinating to think about. Like, the, let me share a quick story. I was in I was in Las Vegas. I was with my my wife, and we were walking through one of the casinos and I just happened to have like a yardstick worth of booze hanging from my neck. Right. Is you know, they sell those like slushies and you get ever clear on top of it, whatever. And we had, we had just gone through like a, I was on a contract for about a year and a half. I was gone from home. Um, my wife and I were kind of celebrating the end of that. We had some friends in Vegas. We're like, you know, we had family watching our kid. It was the first time we'd been out in like two years and I'm like day drinking. It's like 11 o'clock in the morning and I'm just like pounding booze. And we walked by one of these, uh, one of these stores in, I, I don't remember what it was, MGM or whatever, but there's a, there's a celebrity signing of footballs. And it's Joe Montana, right? So Joe Montana is in there signing, autographing things and artwork and whatever. And I'm not the kind of person that'll just like, like one, get excited or that excited over celebrity. Yeah. And then two, um, I had some social lubricant in me and I'm not usually the kind of person that starts yelling at people like, Hey, it's Joe Montana. <laughs> I did that. <laughs> okay. I've done that in my life. I like, I lost the, uh, like the discipline of just like, that's a human being. And he lives his life the way I tried to treat everybody. Like, and it, they just do things that they're known for and that's just fine. But I got, became that guy that got excited and like started walking toward him. I saw somebody who was working at this event, like walking toward me. I'm like, Oh shit, I'm that guy. And I was like, sorry. <laughs> And I walked the other way because for some reason, I thought that I was the most important person in Joe Montana's life for like a, just a split second. So as the majority of people that you interact with, they just see somebody like that and they just get like really wildly excited. Or is there like a malicious intent behind it or an obsession or stalkers or, or things like that? Oh, there's, there's definitely both. You know, there's, there's definitely both. So, I mean, I think most people, I don't, I just think they, they're like, you know, that's what they they dream about you know like to to meet this person or that person or to be you know in the same vicinity you know what i mean like it's you know and, and and but that's pretty easy to differentiate between the two you know what i mean like you you exhibited some some loud behavior you know what i mean like and and so their job was to keep that loud behavior at a distance yeah you know where it didn't interfere with whatever was going on here you know, so like I would have sent someone out to see you too, you know, uh, kinds, yeah. uh, you know, they wouldn't have been like, hey, get out of here. No, not my guys, you know, my friends, they would have been like, yo, hey, check it out, come over here. I know you're having a good time. You know what I mean? But we're doing this, this, and they would have been explaining to you of what you were doing and try yeah. to get you to wake up yourself, you know? Oh, I my mean, wife did it. My wife did a pretty good job of that. <laughs> Wives usually do, you know. Uh, so, uh, a sorry to both my wife and Joe Montana if uh, either, <laughs> if either listen to the podcast. Right, that's crazy. That's awesome. You know, but, but there are there are people that that are malicious. You know what I mean? And and but they they exhibit different energies and 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 body language signs as well. You know, and and and. You know, that's why it, it, it does good to practice scanning rooms. It does good to practice looking for certain uh, body language behaviors that will exhibit certain signs. You know what I mean? Like, if, there's just so many things. Like, I don't want to give away what I look at, what I look for. You yeah. know what I mean? But but there's so many different things that, that you you can train yourself to do. Because all the everything that, that, that I do and what, what people do, we all, these are all perishable skills. So you got to constantly be focused on enhancing your skills. I mean, like, if, you know, if you, you know, you miss a day at the range, that's not good. If you miss a day training, that's not good. You know what I mean? You got to stay consistent with your life. You know what I mean? And, and keep your wits about you to where you're constantly improving your skill set. You know, there's, there is no plateau, plateau. There is no plateau in my game. You know what I mean? There's not like, oh, I got here. I figured it out. No, no, no. There's, it's constant. Okay, I'm at this level. Now I'm going to learn and master this level and I'm going to evolve to the next level. I'm going to keep growing and evolving, you know? Yeah, and then, uh, you know, finally, as we're kind of wrapping up on time here, I just, such an interesting profession. Uh, and then two, like, you've done it in an interesting way. You've done it with 
people of interest. You've done it with, you know, folks in all around the world and supporting in so many different ways. How's it, how's it shaped your perspective on life? Like what, what do you take away from a career, uh, that has developed and matured in the way that yours has, and to have spent time around some of the people that, uh, that you have, like what's, what's changed about you? I think that, you know, it's, it's definitely amplified who I am. You know, I think that, you know, success and hardship, those things, they amplify us, you know, and, and I don't know what, what I can say necessarily has changed. I'm just thankful that I've had um, positions in my life to really practice on who I am and who I, who I look forward to being, you know, I mean, one thing about me is I'm constantly looking to create the best version of who I am, you know, and I think that's what keeps us young in life. You know, it's like, how do I keep creating the better version of who I am? And that's by never settling, you know, and, and as it's, it's allowed me to be the best version of who I am. And then my whole, every, anybody in my life, clients, family, friends, uh, they all reap the benefits of me working on myself. You know, and, and, you know, I, I'm, I feel so thankful in my life to have seen and done the things that I've done, you know, like there's no job application for 99.9% of the jobs that I've had in my life, you know, and, and, you know, I am the anomaly, you know, I'm not, I didn't come out of law enforcement. I didn't come out of military, you know, I, I came out of gang activity and I'm, I am the one that like, I would have never thought that I would have been around somebody, these people that, that influence billions of people collectively together, yeah. you know, and, and it's such an honor for me to, to, to be in these circles that it's humbling, you know, I have a lot of humility with it, you know, and, and it's definitely changed me in a way that, where I could say that, like, it just makes me a better person, you know, it allows me to continue to lift up the people around me. You know, because people are like, oh, you get to do this, you get to do that. Well, you know, but look at the things you get to do, you know, and, I, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll reflect it back at them and, and honor what they do, you know, because it's not about look what I can do, you know, it's about what we can do. 100%, man. Well, hey, uh, thank you so much for taking some time out of your uh, assumably busy day, uh, busy weeks to, uh, to, to chat with me and reflect on a really uh, interesting career. You're a positive man, you're a stoic man. You've got some really great perspective here. Uh, and thank you for sharing it with my listeners, man. I look forward to the next time you and I get a chance to uh, to chat uh, either virtually or in person. Uh, and uh, be safe, take care out there, man. Hey, God bless, appreciate you, brother. Thank you. All right, thanks, Kane.